Can you give us one more round of applause? Thank you. <laughs> um, so Lele started off, uh, us off with a number of stats. I wanted to give you a few more wild stats about the creative industries and what the opportunity is. The media and entertainment industry in the US is seven times the GDP of Lagos State. So think about this. 15 million of us in Lagos go to work 200, 220 days a year, every day. If we did it at the same rate for seven years, the US media and entertainment industry could pay our salaries and you know, fund our lifestyles. To me, that's pretty wild that we're not taking advantage of that opportunity. Some other stats, if you think about the UK creative industries, it's about a third of Nigerian GDP is the equivalent. So when you think about it, the whole of our manufacturing sector in Nigeria is about the same value that the UK gets from its creative industries. When you think about, and maybe some of you are saying, oh, that's not a developing country. When you think about Brazil, the creative industries in Brazil contribute two times two times the value of our oil and gas sector. I don't know if it's the stats that they're applauding. <laughs> but the, the creative industries in Brazil contribute two times the oil and gas sector in Nigeria. So when we talk about the opportunity in the creative industries, I know that often people think it's just something for the young people to do. But I want to start this panel, and I want to really base this panel on, when we're talking about the creative industries, we're talking about serious business. 15 million people in Lagos, seven years of work, that's the equivalent of the US media and entertainment industry today. So that's the backdrop that I'd really like us to have this conversation on. The power has gone off. I thought I'd start with Editi. We shall not be doing that. So I'm now going to start with you, um, Godwin. You work in music, um, and our topic today is looking at reimagining growth and building through an economic downturn. In your sector in music, you, were, you, you certainly reimagined what the music industry would look like when you started Music Business for Africa that focuses on business skills for music. You saw something, right? So I'd be really interested to hear from you, what was the future that you saw that made you focus on the business of music and helping young people develop their capability around the business of music? Um, so the first thing I identified, why, like I'll tell a short story, I'll try to do this in four minutes. Um, when we, when I, ca I came into the music industry from a corporate background, and so I was working and I just didn't, un I lost my mind a few times because a few conversations were very difficult to have. So when I started trying to hire people, I realized that the people I was hiring, I had to train them. So when I trained the people I hired, I realized that they still had to engage the industry. Mm. So we, we thought, you know what, let's just start training people. But what I saw that made it a thing for me, so the average artist that experiences mild success, mild, employs three to 10 people. Mm. And so there are so many programs focused on the creative, on the artist, but nobody, so if we have 1,000 artists across Nigeria, across Africa, who are experiencing mild success, that's three to 10,000 jobs and no one's training them. Mm. Uh, so I went to um, a university in the UK, mm. spoke to the dean, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do my program here. And when I was done speaking to the dean, I realized absolutely nothing they would teach me would be useful here. Mm. Well, I mean, a few things, but most of it wouldn't work. And so I came back, and I looked across Africa, 1,200 universities and not one offers music business management as a course. So we decided to do it. And the purpose behind this is, if we can build, and thank you, if we can build an economy 
that a, an ecosystem that is informed. Because right now, there's a lot of, you know, Obi will tell you, there's a lot of stabbing in the dark. Mm -hmm. if, if we can build an ecosystem that is informed, because economic lean operation applies whether you're in banking mm -hmm. or you're in the music industry. So if we're able to build a system, an ecosystem that is informed, would be able to stop ex exploitation. Mm. So if a major comes in and says, this is what I want to do, if we have educated people, and when I say educated, I'm saying with knowledge about the creative industry, they're in government, they're able to say, you coming in here, here is a criteria for you to do business. If we understand the, the, the path it takes, how creating a song can go from two people sitting in a room to creating a job for the ambulance, mm. right? At an event where you now have more people, you have an event promoter, you have LASMA, you have the, the, the business it carries with it as intellectual property is important. So what did I see? I see us building beautiful homes, beautiful houses, and absolutely no security for it in environments that will damage it. And if we don't develop people quickly, we'll have nothing to show for these beautiful homes. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Godwin. One of the things I find, certainly with the creative industries in Nigeria, is that there's a real lack of diversity of talent. There are lots of creatives, and then everything around them, the legal, the accounting, the business strategy, the, fi you know, the finance, the logistics, all of that stuff, is I feel that's the urgent opportunity yeah. because it's called show business for a reason, right? There's a business at the end of the show yeah. or like even wrapped around the show. So absolutely. Um, I think the MBA model is, is really interesting. I'll, I'll come to you now, Moses. Um, Godwin has talked about the future that he saw with music and the business side of it. And I think when we think about the theme that we're talking about today, reimagining a lot of people, when we think about reimagining, it's about completely changing the model, right? Let's throw everything away. The baby, the bath water, the bath, you know, everything. Um, whereas I know that when we reimagine, there's still some parts of the legacy infrastructure. There's still some parts of the current model that we need to keep. And you work in cinema. Cinema is the sort of bedrock of the legacy film industry. But how do you see the role of cinema in this reimagined future um, and, and this economic downturn that we're building through? Thank you, Ajoma. I hope you can hear me. Um, good morning to everyone. Really great to be here. Um, great to have Endeavor um, organize sessions like this that also spotlight the creative industry. Um, great to uh, hear Godwin talk about uh, the importance of like seeing you know, the creative industry from a business perspective. And I think that's what we've managed to do over the last 10 years from a film house group perspective. Like you said, uh, this year has been quite challenging, um, and I don't think it's um, uh, peculiar to the creative sector or the cinema sector. Um, it's just that there's been a cocktail of a number of challenges after the pandemic. And if you also look at what is a great positive for the industry with the advent of streaming, um, you, it, that has also had its own toll mm. on, on cinemas. But as an entrepreneur, you continue to see uh, opportunities even with, with the challenges that, that exist. And, and for us, the cinema industry is so vital um, to, 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 to the success of film um, in, in, in the country. We, we, we think that it is the one important gateway as far as, far as the local film industry ecosystem is concerned. Um, and in terms of reimagining, like you said, we're not looking at changing anything particularly. We're looking at the sector evolving, where we want it to be more inclusive. Uh, right now, a lot of people will argue that uh, mainstream cinema is very middle class, upper class, um, and, and uh, you know, the particular price points for uh, cinema films maybe exclude a certain class of society. And, and that's what I love about the evolution of technology and tech entrepreneurs. As, as I speak to you, there are various engagements with um, tech entrepreneurs around how we can look at communal screening experiences, 
how technology can help us leverage existing infrastructure, like viewing centers, for example, like bars and lounges in towns and villages. Um, and for example, you have an Uber, uh, an Airbnb um, portal that aggregates all those locations, and you can find a way to get you know, the latest film to those locations. And at the same time, um, the existing cinemas, how can we make them beyond cinema, beyond just going to watch a film? Can they become more entertainment complexes? And these are the, the, the challenges we're setting for ourselves. Um, a lot of people do not know that the cinema sector last year was 7 billion naira in box office, but that's just box office. The retail spend and the advertising spend brings it to a 15, 16 billion naira a year industry with just less than 70 locations. And there is prospect for growth even in that middle class to upper class um, um, uh, tier. So we're looking at how we can make it more inclusive for all. At the Filmhouse Group, we're doing beyond just cinemas. We're also very much involved in producing content and very much involved in distributing content to the major streamers. And, and so we're, we're looking across the whole value chain, but we know that, like you said, um, the, the, the legacy impact of cinema cannot be you know, undervalued. And in, in, from a continental perspective, we remain Africa's biggest hope in terms of, you know, pro, uh, you know um, in terms of the positioning of local content. No other country has the share of box office like Nollywood has in its own local market. In South Africa, it's below 10%. In Kenya, it's not existent. In Ghana, the industry has probably almost disappeared in terms of local content. In Nigeria, the prospect is potentially 40% of box office. Um, it, 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 from coming from a... Yeah, thank you. Where just less than 10 years ago, it was less than 5%. So I, I, I think for, for me, that is the real imagining of like, what can we do with the results we're getting? What can we do with the resilience we're showing? What can we do with the increased attention that the sector is getting? And how can we ensure that we are projecting the best of us even in very dire times? Absolutely, thank you. I, I'm struck by one of the numbers that you mentioned there, Moses. Did you say that it was seven billion in box office and an additional how much? In additional eight billion in retail. So when we say retail, popcorn, drinks, hot dogs, activations on your foyer, and then advertising. So an additional eight billion. So for every one naira that you made from the film, there was an additional 1.1 or 1.2 naira from everything else, which I think is pretty wild. Because when we're thinking about employment in film, we're thinking about the filmmaker and everybody involved on set and distribution. But the boys and girls selling popcorn behind the counter, they work in the film industry. Your janitor that's cleaning your film, they work in the film industry. Absolutely, the printers that print the banners and everything, and the electricians and a number of them. And that's why this platform is so critical for us to be able to shape the narrative and say there is a business to what we do. There, there is a formal structure, there's legal, marketing, audit and compliance, there is governance, you know, all of these things, you know, that propel the business that we run. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that, Moses. Obi, Obi is the real OG of everything that we're talking about. <laughs> Obi, you started Storm Records in 1991. What were you guys doing in 1991? Primary school, nursery school? With God in heaven, perhaps. <laughs> but 1991, you started Storm. Um, and, and I know that lots of people are doing great things now, but now you have like references to, to look at. Whereas in 1991, I imagine there weren't that many things to look around and say, based on this, I, I foresee this. So tell us, Obi, your crystal ball, what did it tell you in 91 that made you start some records? Yeah, th uh, hello. Yeah, thanks a lot. And first of all, good to be here. I think in 91, I have to just accept, we were basically nuts, right? We weren't, there was no real imagination about the future to that extent, except that I was 100% convinced that what Nigerians had inherently in terms of talent was world class. Mm. And I, didn't, and I hated this thing of, oh, it's good for Nigeria. You know, there's a phrase that used to happen a lot. Ah, oh, you really try. You people are trying. 
I hate, I hate that, right? So I was convinced that there was something happening here within my generation, within the sounds I was hearing. And you have to understand, and it's something I say a lot, that Nollywood and Afrobeats are the first two startup industries in this ecosystem. Mm. And they inspire the Nigerian tech ecosystem by providing the soundtrack and the inspiration for those who've gone forward. So the thing about it is, my inspiration was the belief, which I've had all my life, that our talent and our story is compelling and it's worldwide. And because our mythology is older than Greek and Roman mythology, it's older than every other mythology. I talk about this a lot of times. I don't want to talk about Shango and Thor because I talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. But if you take Shango as one, there are at least a thousand other properties of that nature in Nigeria. We have a thousand cultural festivals. I believe we've only just scratched the surface. Yeah. So for those who are thinking, oh, it's late to enter the sector, I think it's just beginning. We're just getting to a stage where the Nigerian government, the Nigerian financial institutions are beginning to understand that they can invest and back this ecosystem. Um, some of us have been begging them to look at it for years, but we're now at a stage where it makes manifest sense. And also, if you're a progressive and mature Nigerian, it is kind of embarrassing that we are the least investors of our own content. Absolutely. Because I think that's something that must be said, that whether it's Netflix, Africa Magic, Multi-Choice, these are the brands that have given us the distribution platforms to take our content global. Uh, but I will tell you that if I could tell you that in 1992, when I signed Junior and Pretty, that I knew that that would lead to whiz kids selling out the, st the Tottenham Stadium, I'd be lying. But it's a beautiful thing to see. And the great thing is maybe we don't understand what it means that two Nigerian artists sold out stadiums in London in 2023. I'm not sure there's a black British artist that can sell out a stadium yeah. in the UK. You know, that is an incredible thing. We come with no capital. We just disrupt it through these digital platforms and our own viral nature and our ability to connect. But if we can get capital to back the content, I think the future is unimaginable. Absolutely. Thank you, Obi. I was hoping I could bring Aditi in at this point to talk about capital, actually, and Black Book. But it seems like that ain't happening. <laughs> um, right. I, I think you raised an, an interesting point there about tech and, and creative industries. I remember I did a study back in 2022 for UNESCO. We were looking at the creative industries in 94 countries around the world, and one of the conclusions from that study was, it's becoming impossible to distinguish between what is the digital economy and what is the creative economy. The lines are blurring a lot. And that's because when you think about it, what's the digital economy? It's large platforms, it's social media. But think about Instagram without video or TikTok without music, it's just not possible. They won't be what they are. And so I think as we reimagine the future of the creative industries, we have to be thinking about digital. We have to be thinking about technology. We have to be thinking about emerging tech, AI, generative AI, you know, virtual reality, all that kind of stuff. Obi, were you going to say something to yeah, that? Yeah, I wanted to say something about the fact that I think one of the biggest opportunities for us is to understand, you know, if you look at the music industry, if you look at our influencers, Nigerian soft power easily has a billion followers today. It's, yeah. not, it's not potential. That's a billion followers. The gap is in product, right? Okay, if you remember the Kardashians, I mean, there's no real talent, mm. but a product, right? <laughs> Sorry, hope I didn't offend anybody. But the product, right? Merchandise. We have to merchandise this industry. We have to create products that we can sell. We have hundreds of Nollywood female actresses. Where are the hair products? Where's the fashion products? Yeah. Our musicians, same thing. Our sportsmen, same thing. So we have this enormous pools of influence, and we have the street markets that can make the stuff, but we have disconnected marketplaces. Absolutely. So we need that. That's where the tech guys come in, because we need them to come in and enable the creatives to, to build the solution. Because really, that's where the money is, right? Touring yeah. and merchandise, touring and merchandise. And not just touring for musicians, 
for comedians, for variety, entertainment. And that's where the venues and infrastructure come into the mix yeah. as well. I, I think touring, merchandise, but also licensing. Because think about, I've always wondered what we would do if we could make game <laughs> characters from Nollywood characters. Like, uh, that would be pretty wild, uh, wouldn't it? So, Were you going to say something to yeah, that? Um, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I think the key thing is our IP. It literally is the foundation of everything. And one of the biggest mistakes we've continually made is selling that IP consistently. And so we have, I mean, I represent Sony Music Publishing. And I have to say this, shout out John Platt. And I say this because he comes into the system and says, the writers first. So when we sign artists, we tell you, do not give away your rights. And this is a global company saying that. So what, what we do here and what we've continued to do is we've continued to sell our intellectual property. And within that intellectual property carries our culture, our, our entire identity, who we are as a people, our language, ETC, and we continually sell it. Now, more people are, we have a lot of Africans who are now migrating. Now, I know there's like, oh my God, everybody's leaving. But there's value in that as well. Because the African that is in the university in London is the one telling his English friend, that you need to listen to this music, you need to eat jollof rice, you need yeah. to you know, learn this dance. That is our intellectual property that's traveling. What we need to identify and where tech comes in, because tech is not this demon. Tech just helps you scale. Yeah. So what it's supposed to do is, how do we connect the, 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 the speed at which our IP is traveling and carrying with it our, our music, our culture, our language, and ensure that the benefits of that comes back home. Yeah. 100%. And, and you talk about tra that music traveling, you talk about the soft power. I remember getting out in the airport in Montego Bay in Jamaica, and you know when you travel now, it's not a surprise to hear Afrobeats. You, you just, it's a matter of course. But my mind was blown. The taxi I got into from the airport was playing Talk by Alabi. Like, we're not, it's not... <laughs> You know, that is pretty wild, because it wasn't Wizkid, it wasn't Burna, it was Tokyo Alabi. And I was asking the taxi guy, like, is this something you guys listen to all the time? And he said, yes, it's not even his, his, his music. It was a radio station that was playing Tokyo Alabi, and I thought, oh, wow, okay. My music travel, no visa. That's the, no the, visa. the absolute case study of that. <laughs> I see we now have Editi, and we're fast running out of time. Aditi, apologies, it has been off and on, but I, I really wanted to ask you, we were talking about capital earlier. I don't know if you heard that part of the conversation, but we were talking about capital and local capital in the creative industries and how critical that is. And I, I can't think of any better example of where local capital has gone to create a world-class um, creative product from Nigeria. So first of all, let's give a round of applause again for, to Aditi for Black Book. Um, I, I'd really like to hear from you, Aditi, two things. One, just give us a run through of the numbers that Black Book has done. And then please tell us about local capital and what that did for the realization of the project Black Book. Uh, is he muted? Is Aditi muted or are we just not? Aditi, I think you're muted, if you can hear me. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry. It's uh, uh, half past two here, so my, my sense of humor hasn't kicked in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe we're talking about the, uh, 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 we're focusing on local capital and uh, the creative industry. Um... Yeah, Aditi, I was Oh, out. okay. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the, the film and, and with a focus on, on local capital. Um, uh, the, the Black Book, obviously, is, has been called Nigeria's first uh, blockbuster, and, and um, we're pretty excited about what he's done around the world. Um, sorry, hey, am I am I on? Yeah, we can hear you, Aditi. Carry on. Okay. Um, sorry, we are having this um, technical challenges. Um, well, I think the the um, demonstration of maybe the impacts of of the Black Book globally has been, for us, how um, it was the number one film in South Korea for a couple of weeks and and South Korea is a country that has its own film industry, it's got its own, uh, they watch a lot of South Korean uh, content, national content. And and this tells the thing, uh, as Nigerians, like our stories can travel, our stories with black faces, you know, Nigerian English, um, local languages, Hausa, Yoruba in there, that they can travel the world. So the question then is, why did it travel the world? Um, it's a story that is very hyper local. It's very local, but it can connect because everyone around the world feels the same couple of emotions. They feel joy, they feel sadness, or they feel happiness, sadness, they feel grief, you know, the, and they feel love as well. And these emotions are fundamental. It does not matter if the person is in China, in India, or in America. They all feel the same emotions. However, they're used to seeing content of a certain quality. And so if they, can, if they can see the same quality that they see in their own stories, in Hollywood stories, in an African story, then they, they will watch those stories. And so uh, this was actually the thought process behind us taking the risk of making Black Book. But talking about the capital of it, if you conceive a thing to make it, it obviously is gonna cost, if you wanna make a, a picture that is directly targeting the international market, it's gonna cost a bit more than what it, it would with the average film that you're advocating for local industry. Uh, the the post-production process will be different, the production process will be different, the, the quality standards gonna be higher, a bit higher. And so those are the things I believe that you have to have in place um, before you, you set out to make what of a picture. Um, for us at Africa wow. Film, we had been very insistent on making pictures and exporting them to a global, uh, to the global stage. Uh, the thinking is that if we can do that successfully the first time, the second time, the third time, you actually can build a bridge between our local industry and the world. And, and Nigeria so, like sorely at this moment needs uh, uh, FX. And if you can invest in Naira and at a very high quality and, mm -hmm. and record successes mm -hmm. globally, mm -hmm. then we can build an industry that is, because the Nigerian industry can be set up to be a production market. Um, say the streamers, the streamers are trying to increase the numbers in Nigeria, which is great. But with the economy the way it is, I think the ideal thing is to position Nigeria as an export market for, a production market for export. Um, invest in Naira, exit in the USD, invest in Naira, ex exit in foreign exchange. So this is, this is the ideal situation, um, you know, for us. This is the, the, most of the money we raised for the Black Book was raised in Naira, uh, and of course we exited the USD. So um, I think ultimately that we need more patient capital. Um, of films can be a very strong vehicle to export culture, but also earn strong for an exchange. We need to we need to ex expand access to patient funding. Um, I'm glad to see that since we announced the way we 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 basically announced the way we funded the Black Book, the, the same vehicle has funded um, other films in the industry currently in production. But it took four years to make the film, The Black Book. So the, the funding has to be a bit more patient than most people are used to. If you are going to create for the globe, for the world, then you have to, have to be patient 
enough to do stuff to the standards that people are used to. Um, and, and that patience is what built the overnight success that we've seen uh, with the Black Book. It's overnight success, but it was cooked over a four-year period. Um, we also need tax incentives, ultimately, for, for the market. At the moment, there's a lot of productions that go to South Africa and not Nigeria. And the reason for that is there's a tax break system that encourages producers to go to South Africa to make the films. And if we can have that um, in Nigeria, I think it would encourage more big productions to come to Nigeria. And the reason this is important is because I, I believe that, you know, every industry benefits from ten poles. And ten poles invests money in the markets and that money trains people, upskills people and ensures that people are actually ready to do the big things so that we will not be taking like if, if you have a big uh, post-production project. Um, I know three of the, the next big pictures out of Nigeria are post-produced outside of Nigeria. Um, so that capital and tax incentives would actually allow first the building of like global standard post-production hubs in Nigeria and also um, allow, allow those skills to be transferred to Nigeria so that you will not be taking um, you know, big post-production projects out of Nigeria. So it's, it's a long process, it's, uh, but we have to build the train tracks to build that. Um, if we want to build a $100 billion economy out of the creative industry, we have to also make the investments that allow us to do that. And um, Absolutely. that is, I think, my, my thesis for, for the industry for us at the moment. Um, if there are any questions, I can take them. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that's a good place to start. If we want to see a $100 billion economy, we have to build the train tracks that take us there to that reimagined future. On that note, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, we can't take any questions because we have run out of time. But we'll lay these guys afterwards um, and, and give them your questions and comments because I know we're Nigerians. There will be comments. Thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of the session.